hello and welcome to today's Jerusalem Press Club briefing, concluding a very long, intense election campaign, the fifth in the past three and a half years in Israel. I'm Tali Dekel, Vice President at JPC. While Benjamin Netanyahu continues to conduct negotiations with his likely coalition partners, the U.S. administration has signaled its dissatisfaction with the inclusion of far-right elements in senior government positions. At the same time, the result of yesterday's midterm could impact American foreign policy towards Israel and the Middle East at large. Today, we host two experts to share their insight on the unfolding situation in both countries and how they overlap. Dr. Nat Wilf is a public speaker and an author. She was a member of the Knesset between 2010 and 2013, serving as chair of the Education Committee and member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. Dr. Wolf is the author of seven books, most recently, The War of Return, co-written with Adi Schwartz, and We Should All Be Zionists. Professor Eitan Gilboa specializes in American politics and international communication at bar -Ilan University, where he was founding head of the School of Communications and the Center for International Communication. He is also a senior researcher at the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, is an author, and the recipient of several international awards, most recently the Distinguished Scholar Award in International Communication from the International Studies Association. Thank you both so much for being here. Uh, so we'll begin with an opening question for each guest uh, before we continue to the submitted questions. Professor Godboa, we'll begin with you. Uh, millions of votes are yet to be counted but early projections indicate that Republicans could reclaim control of the House while the Senate remains too close to call. In general, what will final results mean for potential policy on Israel? The elections of yesterday are critical for both the United States and, and Israel. It is critical for the United States uh, because of the political polarization in the States and the loss of the political culture as we have known it in the United States for, for a hundred of years. Um, this political polarization weakens the United States. Uh, Trump uh, uh, started that erosion in political culture, and it seems to be as tense as it has been in uh, the last uh, presidential elections and even before that. So weak America is also bad for Israel because Israel depends on the United States. And I think that um, weak America has also contributed to Putin's feeling that he could invade and occupy parts of the Ukraine without major American and Western response. So a critical question uh, coming out of these elections will be how the two parties are going uh, to manage their relations in the remaining two years of the Biden administration. Uh, the Republicans um, hope for a, a red wave so far has not materialized. Even if they win uh, both houses of Congress, uh, the margin of, uh, of uh, their success is not going to be as they perhaps would have wished. Uh, they, they will have probably a slim majority in the House and and if and and in the Senate, it's it's very close. Uh, so uh, so both sides could claim victory. Uh, Republicans uh, could say, "Oh, we have uh, taken control of at least one house uh, of the Congress," and Republic and Democrats would say, "Well, it's not uh, well, it's not that bad." Uh, uh, but the question is going to be whether uh, how this is going to be translated in relations uh, with Israel. And I would make these points. Uh, point number one is this, um, Biden hoped uh, for a different result in the Israeli elections. He, he would have liked to see a government of national unity, perhaps a continuation of the present government. He, he is not satisfied with the prospects of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a Netanyahu government uh, that is too far to the right. In earlier uh, Netanyahu governments, he was in the middle. He always made sure to have another party on his left. This time, he is the, the leftist, so to speak, uh, side of his government. And so one variable 
is how much will he be able to control the more uh, extreme parts of his coalition, more specifically, how much control will he have on the, uh, on the religious uh, Zionist uh, party, um, Smotrich and Ben Gvir. Uh, they will apply pressure on him uh, to adopt and implement their own agenda. His agenda is more moderate. So this is, this is one variable. The other variable is going to be uh, the final results uh, in the midterm. Uh, if uh, the Republicans are going to be able to win both houses of Congress, uh, this would be, Netanyahu will be happy about it. This is what he would like to see because of his close relations uh, with the Republicans, with the Republican party and his rela good, good relations with Trump. And Trump is, is still um, has a, a, a very, a very uh, strong, uh, um, he, he strong uh, stand uh, in the party, he controls uh, the party. Uh, he was a, a major force in, in the midterm elections. So um, Netanyahu would have liked to see a Republican control of, of Congress to balance or to block uh, a, a po possible uh, actions by the Biden administration against Israel. Uh, the issues that uh, are on the table in American Israeli relations is always uh, is always military aid. Uh, despite the agreement that Israel signed during um, between between Netanyahu and Obama back in 2016, took place in 2018. It is for 10 years. Israel is receiving from the United States $3.8 billion every year, but because it is spending, Congress has to approve that aid every year. So it is important uh, who controls the Congress. The other issues, uh, the more, uh, the more, uh, the other issues like uh, relations with the Palestinians, Iran, I think uh, there are all kinds of talks about a renewed effort uh, to, uh, to get uh, a nuclear deal with Iran after the elections. This depends also on the, on the results and, and, the, and uh, the Palestinians and, and uh, the, uh, the Abraham Accords. And Netanyahu promised to expand these accords, but I think that this is going to be very problematic because uh, one, the, the nature of his own government and the renewed tension between Saudi Arabia and the United States over oil and gas. So uh, in conclusion, uh, the results are important for Israel. There's going to be as always uh, much continuity in relations, but, uh, uh, but the next two years could see some, uh, some tension between the Biden administration and Israel over those issues which have always separated the United States and Israel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gilbo. And of course, we'll pick apart some of those issues in just a moment. Uh, Dr. Wilf, do you do you agree that it it does essentially matter who uh, who takes over uh, these two parts of government, um, or is the inclusion of religious Zionism, Jewish power in Netanyahu's coalition a strain on U.S.-Israel relations, no matter the outcome? Um, so I'll separate it uh, for the two countries. In terms of the United States, I think whatever the specific outcome, this will be considered generally a Biden or a Democratic victory in the sense that it could have been worse. And uh, the fact that this is probably likely to be one of the better midterm showings for a president uh, is actually going to be considered to the credit of Biden uh, and is going to give him more power uh, as he um, in whatever relations he has uh, with Israel. Uh, it's true that generally, historically, uh, the ability of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu rested a lot with uh, Congress. But I expect both Biden and Netanyahu will have a joint interest in lowering whatever potential for friction and flames exists between the two. So I think we're actually going to see a joint effort uh, to present uh, good relations or at least not uh, friction or relations. Uh, 
Uh, but there are going to be places where things diverge. They're not going to diverge on the military spending. This is above all an American interest, and uh, I don't think anything will change on that. We're actually seeing a much weaker showing for the very extreme elements of the Democratic Party. So in that sense, uh, that's going to be much less of a headache for uh, Biden. So we're, I don't think we're going to see issues around that. We will see issues, as Professor Gilboa mentioned, in terms of the foreign policy priorities. Uh, Netanyahu is certainly a very sophisticated uh, strategist and foreign policy thinker, and he's made it clear that his desire is to expand the Abraham Accords and especially to bring Saudi uh, into the realm of the Abraham Accords. That is not an American priority. It's even going in the opposite direction. I think it's a shame, but this will be an area where I think uh, Netanyahu would like to be able to get more done, would like to get the United States to put its finger on the thumb to promote uh, the expansion of the Abraham Accords. And I think it's going to be unfortunate, but he might not get the kind of support and help that he wished to. Another thing that I've noticed is that, especially uh, in the last couple of years, the Biden administration uh, ma uh, made it very clear that it demands of Israel to be less um, kind of pursuing of its strategic interests when it goes to other countries, especially China. Uh, Netanyahu has tended to be more independent in expanding Israel's relations with countries around the world, especially in the East. It'll be interesting to see how that develops, because in that sense, I think Netanyahu is a bit too much of an independent foreign policy thinker and strategist uh, for the American administration. All the other issues, it's important to say, are not foreign policy issues. Ben Gvir, Smotrich, Shas, uh, they, they are not foreign policy players. The concern that they raise uh, among voters of the left, such as myself, are mostly domestic concerns, concerns about religion and state, concerns about how one defines a democracy, the rule of the courts, the balance between parliament and the courts. They are not real issues for foreign policy and for the United States. They might be issues if you make them issues, if they, you make them issues in terms of like, it doesn't look well, it doesn't appear well, uh, it doesn't uh, kind of gel well with how America would like to think about Israel. But these are not foreign policy players and they're not likely to be people who will uh, kind of present foreign policy change, uh, challenges. I think they're likely to present substantial domestic challenges for the Israeli public, but uh, not foreign policy challenges. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Professor Gilboa, you briefly mentioned the Palestinian issue and obviously Dr. Wolf, this is also kind of a, a local, but also foreign policy issue. Um, this of course is not something that's gonna be brought up uh, in the next government, at least it hasn't been uh, announced as such. Uh, could this be a slippery slope to more partisan support of Israel, something that we've been warned against for years and years, if, if we are completely sidelining the Palestinian issue, uh, you know, in the con in a, by forming a government that has no interest in, in finding a solution? Uh, Professor Gribo, let's start with you. Yeah, the Zionist uh, religious uh, party, um, they have an agenda uh, for the Palestinian issue. If they insist on expanding settlements or, um, uh, or um, allowing uh, or, or encouraging um, the, the use of, of, of um, force uh, that is too much perhaps, uh, then, uh, then it could create um, the tension with the United States. Uh, Netanyahu is very careful, uh, would be very careful not to succumb, not to accept um, all, their, all their demands, uh, simply because um, uh, they will be competitors in the next elections and he has no interest in increasing their power. On the contrary, he would like to reduce the power of that, of that party and um, he would not mind appointing uh, Benvir to Minister of Homeland Security simply because he's likely to fail 
And if he fails, then perhaps next time uh, he would not be as, uh, as strong as he, as he is now, is not as popular as he is now. Now, um, the, those who um, uh, dislike Israel in the United States, especially in the Democratic Party, those who are hostile to Israel, the progressive part uh, of, of the party, uh, they don't need uh, Ben Gvir or Smotrich uh, to criticize Israel and to try to damage as much as possible American-Israeli relations. And Biden, in the first two years, uh, has been able to, to block them or control them. Yet, uh, the overall climate of opinion is important. Uh, the, the, um, the values environment is important. Uh, the values that are presented by Ben Gvir and Smotrich are not typical American values, either on the left or the right. But, um, but I expect, uh, as Inat said earlier, that the two sides will make an effort to prevent uh, major clashes, but it still depends on Netanyahu how much he would be able to, uh, to control, as I mentioned earlier, to control his, um, his me members of his, of his uh, coalition. Inat, do you wanna add on to? Uh, certainly, uh, I think one of the things that we need to, hopefully, if there's ever a chance to finally to put to bed, is that on issues relating to the Palestinians, uh, the, the fundamentals of the conflicts are unchanging for the last century, regardless of whatever Israeli government or coalition is. The conflict has is has always been certainly from the Palestinian perspective used to be the entire Arab perspective much less so today uh, has been about the complete denial and rejection of the Jewish right to self determination in any part of the land. Whenever any Arab party leader country showed even the smallest inclination to make peace with Israel the most determinant factor, and that will never change, is that the Jews are destined or damned to be a tiny religious, ethnic, national, linguistic minority in an overwhelming Arab and Islamic region. This means that if the Arab side, countries, leaders, make gestures towards true peace with Israel, they will always find, whether the leader is right-wing or left-wing, they will always find a willing partner for making peace, simply because every Israeli leader, left-wing or right-wing, is keenly aware of the status of the Jews as a minority in an overwhelming Arab and Islamic region. This is to say that it actually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which Israeli government there is. What matters is, are we finally going to get to the point where there will be a Palestinian people who develop an ethos that says, we are interested in building an Arab Palestinian state next to Israel rather than instead of Israel. For the last century, we have not had such a people and therefore they never had a leader which would make that claim. When that changes, they will always find an Israeli leader who will say yes. So that's the one thing. And until that, we need to put the whole issue to bed because that's where it stays. But this again brings us to why it's so important to continue the Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords are the only hope of getting to broader peace, not just with more Arab countries, but with Palestinians. As many Arab leaders say, once the Palestinians realize that they no longer have the broad Arab and Islamic envelope for their decades, more than a century of saying no, they might finally go through the painful process of learning to say yes. Getting a country like Saudi on the side of the Abram Accords will be a dramatic change both in terms of pointing that the Arab and Islamic world are on the side of normalization, acceptance, and embrace of the Jewish right to self-determination. 
So this is where we need to go. If people really care about peace, if people care about the Palestinians, the key is how do we get the Palestinians to develop a different vision for peace than the one that they had for the last century? The Israeli government, and I will make perhaps a bold and broad claim, but it's true, the Israeli government and the Israeli people are never going to be the one that are going to be an obstacle to true peace with the Arab world and with the Palestinians if they have finally made their peace with a Jewish state in this land. Okay, the message is clear. Uh, Dr. Wolf, I wanna move on to another uh, part of the theme of Netanyahu's independence and foreign policy, as you put it, uh, and how this relates to the, to the, to the American-Israeli uh, uh, dynamics. Um, Netanyahu is much closer to Putin than uh, than Bennett and uh, and uh, Lapid, obviously, um, presenting him with uh, a, a renewed issue that he didn't have to deal with in his in his last in his last round. Uh, taking into account the geopolitical situation now uh, of Israel and Syria and and the war in Ukraine, um, do do either of you think that the new government in Jerusalem may choose? to appease the Americans this context, in this context, or it's just gonna to be too difficult now, given, given what we just said. I can, I can, I imagine that there would be no major change. I have not, Netanyahu criticized almost every policy or every step of the present government. Uh, he did not criticize much Israeli policy in the Ukraine crisis. Uh, I don't know if his relations uh, with Putin is going to. So there was there's a lot of exaggeration about his close relations with Putin to begin with, but uh, I I don't know and I don't think that he is going to, to dramatically change um, uh, his policy on Ukraine or on Syria. Uh, Russia is very hard pressed in 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 the Ukraine. It does not seem to want another battlefield in Syria. So I think Israel is likely to keep its freedom of action uh, in, in Syria for, for the time being. Zelensky believes that Netanyahu could help uh, Ukraine more than Lapid. And uh, he said so. He said that he expects Israel uh, to provide uh, Ukraine uh, with uh, air defensive systems. But I think that um, uh, both Ukraine and the United States cannot ask Israel to supply any type of weapons that the United States itself is not ready to supply. So, so this, this has been the dilemma uh, over time. I think that Netanyahu is going to continue the same policy. He may, he may um, try to improve relations uh, with, with both sides. I don't think he's going to mediate because there is no base for mediation. I think that Bennett's attempt to mediate was, was, was a farce that did, didn't make any sense. And he, he would like to, on the, on the one hand, not to antagonize too much Russia. And at the same time, uh, to, uh, not to antagonize Russia and, 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 and not the United States. Uh, his, uh, policy, his strategy would be uh, to perhaps in, in keep good relations with both Russia and the United States and still create the feeling that Israel, this is what Lapid has been doing all the time, uh, to create at least the, 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 the perception or the image that, the, that Israel is standing with the West, that, um, that it does not accept the use of force in Ukraine and, and crimes of war and the, and, and, and the destruction that is going on there. So Israel has been playing a very tight rope on, on Russia and, and the Ukraine. I think about China, this is another issue because for the United States, China is the number one issue. Three successive American presidents defined Russia as the number one rival um, uh, of the United States. And um, so uh, and in the past, there were all kinds of disagreements. There's still disagreement between Israel and, and the United States over China. China is building too much in Israel. And there is much concern in, in the United States about um, Chinese um, attempts uh, to use all kinds, to use Israel as, as an intelligence base, uh, 
They think that they implanted um, listening devices in the port of Haifa and other places. So this is this will continue to be uh, an issue that the two sides will have to sort out. Dr. Wolf, do you agree that uh, that the uh, that the status quo with Russia and Israel will remain, or could something change? Um, I think uh, again, Netanyahu is likely to be more and more. Um, let me put it this way: he's a again a very sophisticated, keen uh, student of power relations. He understands them very well, almost in a visceral uh, way. Uh, so, uh, and he's uh, razor focused on uh, the national interests of Israel, as surprising as it is, which means that he will look at opportunities between Ukraine and Russia, generally free of any uh, virtue signaling uh, to see uh, how he can advance Israel's national interests. And uh, if he'll find opportunities to do so uh, with Russia, maybe in the weakening of Russia, uh, he'll do so. If he'll find it with Ukraine, he'll do so. Uh, but uh, I think he's less likely to be dragged to any notion that this is a moral issue. He's more likely to try to pursue and see uh, what are Israel's interests, uh, if he can advance any of them in the region uh due to the war he'll do so on the mediation issue if by the way if he might think that there's an opportunity where israel could gain uh he's not likely to fall for it just for grandstanding but if he might think that there's a real uh benefit here i don't uh rule it out but he will treat it uh again i think in a much more cold calculated way to see what are the opportunities for advancing Israeli interests, period. Okay. Uh, Professor Gilba, you mentioned the, the Iran deal that currently isn't really going anywhere, but what about Iran's influence in the region? Uh, do you think that the results of either political developments in, in the US or in Israel uh, could lead to some sort of change in regional mobilization maybe against Tehran? Uh, and the way that the different the different relevant parties interact with one another on that issue. Um, the Biden administration uh, has been eager to reach a, a, a nuclear deal with Iran, going back to the 2015 uh, deal. It has been for a long time in the hands of Iran. Iran is not yet prepared to sign that kind of a deal. There were talks about postponing a new round of negotiations after the results of the elections. Um, the results, I don't think, would uh, make uh, much, it would not influence that much uh, the, the Biden's policy. Uh, when Netanyahu went to Congress back in 2015, he thought that uh, Obama will transfer uh, the issue for. Um, congressional approval, because the U.S. Con Constitution requires that if you have a significant treaty, then it needs two-thirds majority in the Senate. When Obama found out that this was not the case, he simply did not transfer the issue to congressional approval. So even if uh, the Republicans um, uh, are able to control uh, the two branches of Congress, still the administration is free uh, to conduct negotiations and, and, and make a deal. The only problem right now uh, is this. First of all, uh, Iran's um, image in, in the United States and the West in general uh, has been tarnished by two things. One is uh, the, um, the uh, riots and the demonstrations in Iran um, over women issues. So this, um, this um, uh, portrayed Iran in a very negative way. And secondly, the supply of uh, those uh, drones, attack drones uh, to Russia. So there is perhaps less motivation or, uh, or legitimacy in the United States uh, to, to go um, to a new deal. Yet, I still think that there's a good chance uh, that uh, another attempt will be made. 
And obviously, this would be a major challenge to Netanyahu because for him, uh, Iran has always been at the number one issue. The Palestinian issue was number five or number six. And uh, he has been involved in the Iranian issue for a long time and has, um, and has uh, collided with the United States over these issues. So it remains to be seen whether or not the Biden administration will renew the effort to achieve um, a, a, another nuclear deal with Iran. Okay, Dr. Wolf, perhaps we'll get your two cents on the Iranian issue as well before we move on to our last issue, which is obviously the, the, the Jewish community question, which remains a biggie in Israel. Uh, go ahead, please. Um, so just quickly on the Iranian issue, um, and I agree with what uh, Professor Gilboa said, uh, it's just that at the moment, it seems that the priority has shifted on the Iran issue to kind of trying to broadly stop uh, some of the effects of uh, the regime. So especially to try to prevent the lifting of sanctions and to try to prevent uh, the flowing of money, which would come with any agreement and lifting of sanctions, um, because that money has uh, a much more direct impact on the ability of some of Israel's enemies to strengthen and arm themselves. So yes, there will uh, use will be made of events such as the rights on women's issues. And this perhaps goes to the fact that I think it will be highly inconvenient for Netanyahu to have an anti-women government at the time that he's trying to present Iran as a religious backward anti-women place. It's certainly not going to help him if his partners uh, seem to be more Iranians than Iranians. Um, and, uh, and of course, he'll try to make use uh, to the extent that Iran is helping Russia uh, in any way, shape, or form, again, to, to make use of it in order to isolate Iran even further, not just on the nuclear issue, but as we've been witnessing, the broader shift into kind of all Iranian expressions of power in the region and to try to prevent uh, them from being made. Understood. Uh, Dr. Wolf, you mentioned the fact that at the, at the end of the day, people who are critical of Israel will be critical of Israel no matter who's in our government. But is this true also of the Jewish community across the world, members of whom and even leading newspapers have already come out against the uh, potential coalition in Israel? Uh, where do we go from, to from here in terms of Israel diaspora relations when this is what we're, you know, this is what we have at home? So uh, first on the broader issue, I think this is where we're really going to see the tension between Jews in America as a very small minority and Jews in Israel as a majority in a sovereign state. Uh, when you're a very small minority, uh, you can uh, be very focused uh, in certain places, in certain professions. You're not the entire country. When you are the entire country, by definitions, you're going to have left-wing Jews and right-wing Jews, and you're going to have all kinds of Jews because they're the majority, they're the country, they're going to be both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. They're going to be both the MAGA people and the non-MAGA people because that's the entire country. Uh, which it, when you're a minority, the privilege is that you can focus on certain issues, you can be in certain elements where if you're in an entire country, you don't. And this is, I think, where we're going to have a major challenge uh, because there's no doubt that for some time now, there has been uh, a view, an interpretation uh, in the American Jewish community that Judaism in general is a system, a belief system, and a value system that gels with democratic liberal values. Now, that's a true uh, interpretation of Judaism, but as unpleasant as it is, a right-wing Ben Gvir interpretation of Judaism is as legitimate. That's what you have when you have 4,000 years of texts and interpretations and sayings and events. You can interpret those texts and histories and traditions in very liberal leaning ways and in very illiberal leaning ways. And they will both be able to present themselves 
as valid interpretations of Jewish life. And I think this is going to be a highly uncomfortable and unpleasant notion uh, for Jews in America to, that this is also Judaism. Uh, but I think that if we're going to have an honest discussion, we need to understand that all of these are equally, um, call it uh, legitimate or interpretations of Judaism that are steeped in uh, Judaism. And if you want one interpretation, the more liberal interpretation to triumph, then you can't do it by exiting the argument over what it means to be Jewish, you actually have to double down on entering into the argumentation. And that's generally going to be my invitation to Jews of the United States. Enter the arena of argumentation, but do it with the understanding that the, other, uh, the others are also arguing that their interpretation of Judaism is the correct one. You have to fight them, you have to disprove them, but they're fighting in the same arena. Professor Gibbon, do you agree with the same kind of idealistic approach that if we if we talk about it, then there's room for everything? Or do you think that this might be, uh, you know, um, a, a negative direction in terms of relations between Israel and the, and the diaspora? I think that I've seen uh, coverage in American newspapers about the emerging uh, Netanyahu's uh, coalition. And it's quite interesting to see how much, how little they know about politics in Israel. And you would think that um, very known journalists, even I've read recently a piece by Tom Friedman uh, about, uh, about um, the, the emerging coalition. And it, much of it is simply uh, not true uh, and far-fetched. So I think that this would be interesting to see and to compare how the New York Times, for example, uh, uh, will cover the results of uh, the elections in the United States, given that Republicans will still uh, gain some, um, some control over Congress, uh, at least in the House, and compare it with the kind of coverage they provided uh, for the emerging Israeli coalition I think that they have been very extreme in their criticism of this emerging coalition compared to what they will be saying on uh, the situation in the United States. I, I am concerned about certain additional erosion in, America, in Israeli relations with American Jewry. There is a rift. There has been a rift between, uh, between the two sides for some time now. And the image or the perception of what uh, Ben Gvir represents uh, might increase that rift. And I'm also concerned about uh, the standing of Israel in international organizations. Uh, Israel has been facing many problems uh, at the so-called United Nations Human Rights Council. Uh, this, this council is a joke. They really do not deal with human rights uh, in the world. But there is one committee at that council, a permanent committee uh, that was established uh, um, after the um, uh, Guardian of the Walls operation in Gaza. It's a permanent committee uh, to investigate alleged Israeli crimes in, in Gaza and, and, and Judea and Samaria. And uh, they don't care about um, human rights violations in China, Russia, Iran, other places, but they, they, do, uh, uh, they do obsessive and excessive um, uh, reporting and, and defamation uh, of Israel. Uh, and the United States under Trump has been useful in limiting or blocking um, uh, voting and resolutions. Uh, in those organizations, if the Biden, the Biden administration has not as not has been as good or efficient in that area, maybe here a Republican uh, Congress could help uh, to ensure that uh, uh, that the United States is not going to desert Israel in international forms. Okay, I think that's a good place to finish up uh, because we are out of time. And yes, let's hope that we aren't deserted by anyone. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Eitan Gilboa and Dr. Inat Will for joining us for this briefing. 
I'd also like to thank my colleague, Ellie Klutzstein, for facilitating this call. Uh, have a good day, everybody. We hope you enjoyed that briefing by the Jerusalem Press Club. If you did, like the video and hit the subscribe button to stay up to date with all of our future content.